Are we good? Sweet. All right, well, as that graphic says, we are starting our semester study tonight in 1 Peter. So, if you would turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Peter 1, we're going through verses 1 through 9. And so, I'm very excited to take you guys there tonight and what Peter has for us in the Word of God. So, give you guys a second to get there in your Bibles. All right, so starting in verse 1, the word of the Lord. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the, re- at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word, and I ask that you would speak uh, through me tonight, that it wouldn't be my words, Lord, that these students would hear your words, that you would open up our hearts. Lord, I pray for those of us who have come tonight and don't know you, whether it's our first time in youth ministry, first time coming tonight, first time hearing the gospel, whatever it may be, Lord, would you open our hearts to hear your word. I pray this tonight, and I thank you for your word, and I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name I pray. Amen. So last week, we read through 1 Peter, and we kind of went over the different themes that, that Peter talks about. And it's a deep book, as you guys, I imagine, went over in your discussion groups. There's all kinds of things that Peter touches on, suffering, trials, Jesus Christ and his role in our salvation, talking about what it is to submit to different leaders, wives submitting to husbands. There's all kinds of things that Peter touches on in this book. And I'm just super excited to uh, bring you guys our introduction into this. And so one of these key themes, though, that Peter touches on in 1 Peter is thinking about eternity. Now, to help you guys with that, I kind of wanted to start tonight with an analogy. Imagine that you've been walking through the desert for, let's say, two, three days, and it's 120 degrees out, say you're in Saudi Arabia or whatever, and you're, you're thirsty, you're starving, your tongue's stuck to the roof of your mouth, that's how dry it is, and you come across an oasis, and it's got fruit, it's green, the first time you've seen something green in three days, and you go and drink the water, and in it is just a well, maybe the size of half this room, not that big, but it's enough, right? I mean, you'll take anything at this point because you've been you know, thirsty for three days. And it's the purest water you've ever drinking. It's the cleanest water you've ever drinking. And you're like, oh my gosh, I just want all of this. I wish there was more. And then let's say there's a ridge out and then somebody's coming over that ridge and says, hey, if you just can't climb over this ridge, there's an ocean of that good, clean water. Now that's the vision that Peter gives us here for the Christian life. We have the oasis here in the word of God and the gospel preached. But we know that because Christ will return and we will dwell with him forever as Christians, we will taste the ocean. We get a taste of it. We get just a brief taste and a brief glimpse into it in this small little oasis that we have in the word of God here. But we know that the ocean is coming and it's promised to us. And that's one of the key things that Peter gets at here as we go through with the themes of inheritance and what it means to be an elect exile. And that brings me to my first point tonight. What does it mean to be an elect exile of Jesus Christ? Well, let's start by defining the word elect. To be elect is to be set apart by God. 
Peter states this in verses two and three, right? Uh, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in verse three, he has caused us to be born again, right? So this is God's work. It, if there's one thing I want you to take away from election, it's that this is God's work. When you hear the word election, you should think, I'm chosen by God, that your salvation had nothing to do with you. So you were chosen by God, but when did God choose you? Did God choose you when you chose him? What does the text say? The foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, Ephesians 1 tells us that this was before the foundation of the world. So before God created the world, that's when he decided to save you. And so let me ask you this. Did you do any good work to do that? Did maybe God think, oh, well, you know, Susie or, you know, Timmy will do something nice and that's why I will save them? No. Why did God elect? Why did God choose to save? Well, if we look at verse three, it says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. It's according to God's mercy that we're saved. It's a work of God that we're saved. That's what election means. Election means you're chosen by God out of his good and gracious purpose, not anything we did. Now, that's a big and weighty concept. We can't conceive of what it was like before creation, right? But we know that God existed before he created the world, and the Bible tells us in many places that God had a plan to save the world even before uh, creation began. We'll go into what, this, uh, what he planned to give us er a, a little bit later, but I wanted to get a definition of what election means before I get into that. And so when you think of election, think chosen by God for, by, for his gracious purposes. The fact that you believe was planned and chosen by God way before you had a thought of creation at all. It was before, it was as he was setting out the plan of the world. And so that's what election means. Now, what about exile? What does it mean to be an exile? Well, if you grew up in church, you're probably familiar with the story of the Israelites who were exiles in Israel, right? For 400 years, they were under the slavery and the captivity of, e of Egypt. And that's what it's like to live as an exile now. Right? We know from verse 2 that to be elect is to be obedient to Jesus Christ. But the Bible also tells us that the world is not obedient to Jesus Christ, that the world rebels against Jesus Christ. And so, that's, and so in that time, we feel like exiles. There will be times when you feel like you're not quite at home, whether it's on, and maybe you have felt this. You know, those of you who go to public school have probably felt and feel this on a regular basis. Maybe you've been on your sports team, right? And somebody makes a a joke about, you know, oh, those weird Bible believers, or they use the Lord's name in vain, right? And that angers you, but it, they, don't, they don't care, right? They're unbelievers. That's what it's like to live, though, as an exile. It means that your home, right, and we'll get into this later when we talk about inheritance, but your home is with Christ. But because Christ isn't here, there's this feeling of being in exile because we're not quite home yet, but we know, that, and the, the promise is, and this carries us through absolutely everything, the promise is, is that one day we will dwell with Christ. And that's what carries us through everything. So it's a normal feeling um, as a Christian to feel like we're not quite, that we don't quite belong because we don't quite belong. The fact of the matter is, is that this world is fallen and there is sin and, the de and it is in some sense uh, under Satan's dominion, but Christ has won it back with at the cross, with his blood. As uh, Peter says, he's won us uh, to obedience for Jesus Christ for the sprinkling with his blood. We are one by blood. Now, so that's what elect and exile means, right? It means that you are chosen by God and set apart from the world, right? And so moving on to the next point here uh, in verses three to four, so we, we have elect exile, but what have we been saved to? So let's jump into that. Uh, verses three and four say, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Now there's a lot to unpack here, right? In regards to inheritance and a living hope. So first I wanna jump into the idea of a living hope. Uh, essentially, what God means by a living hope is that, think about verse three, resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, right? He's living. 
He's active. He's moving. And right now, Jesus Christ dwells with God. And if you're a Christian, your home is where Christ is. And so your home is in heaven right now. That's why if you die tonight and you're in Christ, you'll go to heaven. And when he returns, your home will be here when he'll make the world new. So that's what it is to have that living hope. Now, what are, what are the things that we hope in, though? Right? We might hope in a sports career. We might hope in to do really well in school. We might hope to start a business one day. Maybe even a good thing like a family. Right? We might hope that, oh, well, maybe the person I'll marry is just going to be this amazing thing. And it might be an amazing thing. But no matter what, all of these things will come to an end. Even if your hope is in the glory of America, one day America will fade. It might not be in your lifetime, but one day it will fade. But one thing doesn't fade, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's the promise that we have as Christians is that no matter what we, no matter what the world tells us that our hope ought to be in, no matter what we, even our own heart, wants to hope in, right? Because we want to build kingdoms of our own here on this earth. We have a hope that doesn't fade. And this carries us through trials. This carries us through suffering. That's what Peter means in verse 3 when he said that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. It is God, thinking back to election, right? This is what God wanted from the very beginning. It is God who wanted you to be saved, chose you, and caused you to be saved. The point is that if you're a Christian, it's, a, it's an amazing work of God that you are. The mere fact that you know Christ is not your work at all. God planned it. This ought to raise our thoughts of God even higher to what they, what they are. Our thoughts of God cannot possibly be high enough. And that's one thing I want us to take away from tonight is just the amazing work of God and what he's given us as a living hope. So Peter has told us why we are Christians. It's because he, uh, God wanted to save us and wanted to make it happen by Jesus' blood and the work of the Spirit in our hearts to wash us by the word of God. Now, what's another thing that we're saved to? So we're saved to that living hope, but what's the other thing that we're saved to? Well, Peter says that we're saved to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. First off, what is an inheritance? An inheritance is essentially a sum of money or land or title that was to be passed down if you were to die. So I'm an eldest son. If my father was a wealthy man and had a bunch of money and land, he dies, I get that. That's an inheritance. So let me ask you something. Did you choose your parents? No, right? No one cho chooses their parents. Some of you might wish that you could have, but I'm sorry to say that you can't. So then can you choose your inheritance? No, you can't choose your inheritance any more than you choose your parents. Yet your inheritance, right, is a gift. Just like good parents are a gift, your inheritance is a gift. And Jesus Christ is the greatest gift that God could possibly give us. And it's unfading, imperishable, because Jesus Christ is perfect. Have you ever thought that maybe, oh, well, what if I could lose my inheritance, right? Like, you know, let's say I was a really, uh, let's say, keeping with the parent analogy, I was a really disobedient son. And so originally, he was, gonna, he was planning on giving me all that land and money, but... Now, sorry, Mackenzie, you're not good enough. We're not going to give you the money. Is that how God operates? Have you ever thought that maybe God is like these earthly fathers who operate on this, this realm of obedience, right? Like if you're, you have to be good enough in order to earn my love. No. Brothers and sisters, we, this, is what, uh, this is the God we have. This is what God does. God sends his son to die for us so that we can have that inheritance. Our inheritance is with Christ. And so that's why it's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. You can no more bring shame and dishonor to Christ. That would be as though taking Christ off the cross. He dealt with your shame at the cross. There's no shame left for you. Absolutely none. So the next time you think, oh, well, I've sinned and I've lost my inheritance. It was a really bad day. I logged into the one website and looked at pornography again, and I've lost my inheritance. God can't possibly love me. That's a lie. That's a lie. You cannot bring shame to Jesus Christ because he bore your shame on the cross. So fight that lie with the truth of the gospel. So this is the living hope and inheritance we have, the promise that never fades in Jesus Christ. And so we can't lose hold of that promise also because verse five to, of what verse 5 tells us. And verse 5 tells us 
that who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Our salvation was a gift from God from the very beginning. Before, as he was planning the world, this was God's plan all along. And he sent his son to die for us, and he knew that we were, and uh, let me back up there. Our salvation was a gift from God, and we are being guarded by him, right? We cannot be separated from Christ because it was a work from God the whole way. So to say that we could possibly be separated from Christ is to undo the work of God. Now, who can undo the work of God? Of course not. No one can. It's God. That's how secure your inheritance is. Your inheritance is as secure as the purity of Jesus Christ on the cross. And your salvation is as secure as, G as God's eternal plan. That's how secure it is. You can't lose the inheritance of Christ because it was never up to you. It was a gift from God. Now, I want us to consider something. How real is this to us? I'll admit, growing up in church, I was told that Jesus loved me and that he died for my sins. Right? I believed when I was about seven that this was true, and I believe that that was a true profession of faith. I believe I've been a believer for that long. I agreed with this. I knew the love of God. But when it came to other areas of my life, I would also think, well, God probably doesn't care about that. Like, he doesn't care about my math test. Like, you know, he's God. He's got other things to worry about. Like, you know, there's hurricanes over in Louisiana and, like, the the f crazy flu epidemic over in Asia and all this other stuff. Like there's, there's probably, God's got way bigger things on his mind than me. But what does verse five tell us? Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let me ask you something. Is there one part of your life that faith doesn't touch? No. So then what does verse five say? If, if God is guarding that faith that touches every part of our life, then God cares about every part of our life. God is with you in every part of your life, every second of your day, guarding you to that salvation that he's appointed you to. If you're a Christian, you are being guarded every second by the God of the universe who planned your salvation before he created the world and sent his only son to die for you so that you might have faith in him and therefore have eternal life with him. That's amazing to me. I just want to rest in that for just a second. Just how amazing God is that he planned it, he won it, and he's keeping us in it to that day. To that day, keeping back to the ocean analogy, when we will taste that ocean. That's how much he's keeping you. So that time in which, like, you know, we, ha we have the oasis now and we're making it over the ridge, he's, m he's with us every second of that journey. He so cares for you. Next time you are tempted to believe that he doesn't care, reject that as a lie and go to him in prayer. That's ultimately, I think, what verse five is telling us to do implicitly is to pray regularly. He does care and is guarding you until you see his face. This is another point I wanna bring up. Have you ever thought that God cares for you um, and gives you that inheritance, as I was saying earlier, oh, he might take you away your inheritance because you've been bad that day. He only gives you the inheritance on your good days. No, brothers and sisters, it's yours because it's Christ. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, it's yours. Um, let's move on to uh, Peter talking about trials. So verses six and seven, I'll just read those. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So P Peter's main point here is that trials bring out and purify our faith. Trials can come in all forms. Peter was uh, primarily writing to Christians who are, who are persecuted, who are being put to death for being a Christian. And I want to, I want to reiterate um, something that I know I've talked about in previous sermons, but that we have brothers and sisters who are dying for this daily. We have brothers and sisters in Afghanistan who are dying, in Iran who are dying, in Libya who are dying, in North Korea who are dying, in China who are being put to the sword. And I want us to think about that as our family members, right? Because you're part of a global plan. It was God's plan to save you, and it's a big plan of salvation that spans the world, that spans history. And I want us to just think about that as we think about trials, right? 
and to pray for those in the body who are under severe persecution. But I don't want us to be tempted to think that because that there are others under persecution that God only cares about them. No, God also cares about you in your trials. And that's another thing that uh, Peter brings home in this passage. Uh, you might, and so what is what is this persecution or trial might look like for us? Well, as I said earlier, you might be ridiculed for being a Christian. You might have to deal with people who use the Lord's name in vain and just scoff at the, fa- the, the idea that they're a sinner or scoff at the idea that they need forgiveness or scoff at the idea of a good God. You may get uh, made fun of for being homeschooled or you might be made fun of for, you know, attending the private Christian school like, oh, you're so rich and smart, Ooh. like, Whatever it might be, right? Any sort of feeling like you're, you don't belong or that you're not, uh, yeah, that you don't belong or that you're set apart or that you're different for being a Christian is a trial for your faith. Or your trials might come with your own sin, that, um, that one sin that you just can't seem to overcome and fall into again and again. Trials may be suffering that you didn't cause, right? Whether it's a grandparent who's come down with an illness or a friend who passed away right? You didn't cause that. That wasn't your fault. But still, these trials come. Or maybe you yourself, you also, you might suffer from depression or anxiety, right? Or just feeling like you don't belong in your family. Or maybe you feel like you don't belong here. You keep coming week after week because your parents make you. You don't feel like you belong. You don't feel like you belong in church. That's another trial. But you love the Lord, Or maybe that your parents don't love you or understand you as they ought to. All these things are trials. Maybe you don't like your school or don't feel like you belong there. Maybe you've been hurt by a friend or a teacher. Maybe you've been betrayed. Uh, Even if you've lived a good life and you haven't gone through any major trials, you've definitely, I know you've seen other people go through trials. So how are you going to prepare yourself for the trials that are sure to come your way? So what do we do with the trials of life? Peter gives us the answer in two parts. And one, the first one, is that God has a purpose in suffering, and this is to bring out faith. The second is that God gives us a greater promise than anything we've ever lost in a trial. So let's read verses 6 and 7 again. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So first, the first point is that you're going through trials for the tested genuineness of your faith. Sometimes our relationship with God is kind of like that with our parents. Uh, I had an example one time when I was 13. My parents wanted me to change schools because I was just in a bad environment at my, at my other school and they wanted me to switch to another school. Now I thought that this was a terrible idea. I didn't trust them at all. I, I, I had plenty of arguments and I fought against them, but ultimately I was 13 and they were my parents. They won. And I'm so glad that they did. And so sometimes, though, don't we ask God, God, why am I going through this? Why on earth would it be that way? It's because we don't trust him. We don't trust his character. Just like I didn't trust my parents to have wisdom and and knowledge and foresight into my situation, sometimes we doubt God's goodness when we go through trials. Yet, what did, what, what did Peter tell us in, in verse 3? He says, according to his great mercy, we need to remember that God is merciful and good in our trials. Another thing that we need to remember in our trials um, is that not just he's merciful and good, but that we have proof that he's merciful and good. I remember as a, when I was growing up in church, I'm like, okay, yeah, God's merciful and good, great. I want us to think about, though, that we have something that we can bank on, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Peter banks on here, right? In verse 3, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ unto a living hope. He sent Jesus Christ down to die for your sins. Of course he cares about you. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans 8, if he who gave us Jesus Christ, how much more does he care about us now? You're going through, whatever trial you're going through, you're going through this so that you would see God as greater, so that your faith would be purified, and that you would worship him and his character. The greatest gift God can give us is a greater reality of who he is and his character. And so that we would be brought to greater thoughts of him, to greater worship of him. We often look to the things of this world to bring us comfort, but God puts us through trials so that we would cling to him for comfort, to cling to his cross for comfort, 
okay? He's not just asking us. Sometimes I think we can think of God as this like big ethereal thing. He became human to die for our sins. He lived 30, 30 or 33 years, depending on some historical dates, and died and rose again. But he lived a normal human life, and I think sometimes we can forget about that. I think, I think sometimes we forget about the humanity of Jesus. And in that time, Jesus wept. He went through absolutely everything that we went through. And so when we go through trials, we must remember that we don't have a God who just sits in the heavens and stand offish to our trials. We have a God who enters in and saves us in our trials. It might be a really bad thing that you're going through. Trials, but remember that trials bring us closer to the Lord. But I want to um, say one thing, that this doesn't mean that whatever happened is a good thing. Cancer is not a good thing. But what is a good thing is what God brings out of it. And that is a greater knowledge and appreciation of who God is. So how can we do this? How do we look to... How do, in the middle of our trials, do we remember that God is good and merciful outside of just clinging to the cross? And that brings us to Peter's second point um, on trials in verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I think about verse 8, and it must have truly astonished Peter, that the people he was writing to had never seen Jesus. They're just like us, right? We've never seen Jesus. But Peter, right, when somebody said Jesus, Peter had a, I mean, he knew what Jesus looked like. It'd be the same thing if I said Jason Wollen, right? The pastor of our church, you know what he looks like. Same thing with Peter. If I said Jesus, Peter immediately has a vision of who that is. This was his friend. This was his Lord that he ate dinner with, that he walked with, that he saw risen again. Yet there are these Christians that Peter is writing to, just like us, who have never seen Christ, yet believe. And that must be an amazing thing for Peter. But the promise that Peter's pointing to is that for us as Christians, who though we haven't seen Christ yet, we will get to. We will get to, and that's the other promise that carries us through trials, that even though what we're going through now may look difficult, we will see Jesus Christ's face. We will get to that ocean. That's a promise. No matter how, what part of the journey you are, how hard that might be, look to eternity, the ocean that never ends. This little sliver of time right now might be really difficult, and I'm not saying that it's not difficult, but Peter reminds us is that it's just for a little while that we will see Jesus' face and we will rejoice and worship him forever and that we long to see that, right? Now, I wanna say something before I close on this point. If you're a Christian and you believe that you're a sinner deserving of God's wrath for your sin, that Christ took the punishment for your sins on the cross and that he rose again from the grave and triumph over that sin, over that death, then you, you ought to want to long to see Jesus, right? Like there's this sense of like, gosh, if I could just see him. Sometimes I'll admit when I'm worshiping, I'm like, uh, I just wish that he was just right there so I could touch the hands that, where the nails were pierced. So that I honestly, I just want to give Jesus a hug. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I rejoice and I, I, that, that thought fills me with such joy. And that's the kind of joy that Peter says it fills up his, his listeners, right? And rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now, I'm going to ask you, you might have been coming to this youth group for a while. Your parents might be Christians, and you might, you might believe that you're a Christian. Do you have any, but, but I want to ask you, do you have any sense of that joy? Not, I don't, I'm not trying to get into levels like, oh, well, this person's more joyful than that person. Just any do you have any joy at the thought of seeing Jesus? Or do you want other things? Like if Jesus Christ were to come back right now, would that be the happiest thing you could possibly look for uh, or uh, think of? Or do you think of something else? Do you anticipate his return? Christians anticipate the return of the Lord, right? Like kids on Christmas morning, all right, like, oh, it's just the anticipation of what they might receive or, you know, that last day of school feeling and just like, oh, man, I might be free. 
Like, I, I, I love that feeling as a kid. I, as an adult, I very much miss the last day of school feeling. But as Christians, we have that last day of school feeling because we know that the Lord is returning and we know we will see him again. And if you don't have that joy, if you don't have any sense of joy or any sense of anticipation, friend, I, I want to ask you, do you know Jesus? Do you really think that you're a sinner and do you really think that you need salvation? Because that's what this is about. And when we know we need it, we want to run to that oasis and we, we rejoice in the fact that there's an ocean of mercy, there's an ocean of love, and there's an ocean of glory in Jesus Christ. That's what the Christian looks for. Jesus is absolutely amazing and his arms are open. So friend, if, if that describes you, if before now you were like, hey, uh, you know, I, I know I go to church regularly, but I never had that joy and, but now you realize that and you want that joy, keep praying that Christ would, would fill you up with a greater sense of who he is. And if this is the first time you've heard the message of Jesus Christ and you want to receive that forgiveness of sins, I ask that you would come forward uh, either to me or one of your small group leaders, whoever, or your friend that you came with. Or if you didn't come with a friend, just reach out to somebody and say, I want to receive Jesus's message. I want to receive his forgiveness. And that, uh, that offer's open to you. It's open to absolutely anyone who will come and receive. He's, uh, Jesus, his arms are open. He's welcoming you to his family, his home. If you're a Christian, I wanna remind you that that is your true home. And you can rest in the promise that God will preserve you to that end. Remember verse five, he's guarding you to that end. So whatever sin plagues you, Right? Whatever trial you may be going through, you have a promise that Jesus will preserve you through that. Jesus is with you in that so that you will see in his face and that you will rejoice and be filled with glory and obtain the outcome of your faith that is the salvation of your souls. This is a promise of the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this promise and I thank you for your word. Lord, I want to pray for these students tonight. I, I pray that they would be filled with that joy. And Lord, if there's something that is fighting with, in their hearts and competing for that joy in you, I ask that you would bring that to light and maybe in our discussion groups, that we would talk about it and they would look to root that out, that we would want nothing else but you. Ruthlessly, Lord, would we pursue after you with our whole hearts. I thank you for tonight. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen.